But I think it's not going to be a world of one cryptocurrency or two cryptocurrencies. There's going to be lots of chains, lots of coins, and um, you know, I and and that's really how I look at it. That is George Semen, and this is episode one of the Blockchain Pro podcast. Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the Blockchain Pro podcast. I'm Adriana Bellotti, and it is my pleasure to be introducing you to the amazing people pioneering the new decentralized world. In this podcast, I'll be chatting to devs, marketers, traders, accountants, really anyone working in the blockchain industry and we'll be learning how they got started and hopefully that will inspire you to join the decentralization movement today's guest is george salmon george started his career in wall street where he worked as a senior portfolio manager technical analyst and market strategist in 2013, he co-founded a Bitcoin trading platform called BTC.SX. These days, he consults and advises startups and has worked with uh, big names uh, such as AgriDigital, Hedera Hashgraph, Livestreams, Praetorian Group, InvestFeed, and GazeCoin. He also writes a blog on blockchain technology and use cases at semantics.com. I've met George a few years ago at a Bitcoin meetup here in Sydney. He's a true pioneer, um, a natural choice for me as first guest for this show. We caught up a couple of weeks ago at the Metropolitan Hotel in Sydney where we have our meetups and we had a really nice chat over a couple of sparkling waters. Here we go. Hope you enjoy it. Okay, we're rolling. Excellent. Hi, George. Hello, Adriana. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? Good, thanks. Thanks for meeting me. Of course. My pleasure. Oh, that's great. Okay, so I think the idea today is to talk about your journey. Okay. Coming into work in the blockchain industry. So it would be good to start with before it all began. What were you doing? Right. Yeah, I think that's a good place to start. So. I started off in finance as a, a trader and a technical analyst. So I, I traded, I managed money for people, I ran a desk um, for equities, and I used technical analysis as one of my main tools for trying to decide where to buy and sell stuff. So um, I worked there for probably um, you know six or seven years before Bitcoin. and. My journey in the world of work kind of parallels multiple bubbles. Since I'm Gen X, like I came out of school and there was the dot-com bust. Um, I graduated from Columbia grad school and right away dot-com bust. Um, job market wasn't so great then, so it was an interesting time to uh, look for work. And then you had this kind of like recovery and then 9-11 happened. And then the markets went into disrepair again and people there's a lot of uncertainty. And then you had the subprime... Um, mortgage crisis which happened, the GFC as they call it here, and again, another giant wipeout of wealth and capital. And uh, at the time that the GFC was happening, I was working you know, on Wall Street and I was literally right across the street from Zuccotti Park, which is where you know, most of uh, the, the, the groups were meeting and, and protesting and much of the activity was happening around what happened and the fallout from that. Um, and around that same time, you know, Bitcoin came into being in, in, in 2009. And, um, you know, as a trader, I get lots of research and analysis comes through my desk. And I guess it was around like 2010, 2011. I was reading this report by one of my favorite technical analysts. And he mentioned Bitcoin and it, the prices started to move up from, you know, $1 to $10 to $20 and fell back down and then went up from 2 to 50 So I started kind of watching it, got interested in it. Um, and, you know, it, it was this thing that was kind of sitting there that, like, interested me. And um, I came on a trip to Australia in 2012 where I decided that I was going to move here and live. And around that time, I had read uh, the, the Bitcoin white paper for the first time after talking to some people. And I hadn't read it yet. I just was following the price and looking at this new asset and seeing the volatility in it, which is 
what you like as a trader and what you look for. So once I read that, I thought it was a really powerful concept because of censorship resistance, basically. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people don't understand that in the Western world because we have stable monetary systems. We have ways to get our money back when it's taken from us. But really, that concept is super powerful for a lot of the things that have been happening in the world over time with central banks that uh, deflate currencies, use tools that make currencies more and more worthless, or inflation comes and your money's not worth as much as it was yesterday, like in Argentina, where you have capital controls put on you, and literally your money can be taken from you overnight. Like the Saudi Arabian princes, who are worth billions, have lost a lot of their uh, money because there was no place for them to put it and it was seized from them, right? So. That to me became a really powerful thing, and it's not just like the, the Bitcoin itself, it's like files, it's, it's data, it's, it's content, it's anything between, on, on a blockchain. And, and that concept means a lot, even though people always like to think you know, it, it, it leads towards these fringe groups of people who are doing illegal stuff. It's not. It's really a way for people to protect assets that they can't protect in any other way. So I came to Australia in 2012. Um, Decided to move here around that time. I was working at a fish burners actually, and I met this guy Joe Lee, and we co-founded a company together called BTC.sx, which at the time was one of the only ways that you could uh, go long or short versus your Bitcoin with leverage. Um, at the time that we found the company, you know, Bitcoin was going through a massive, massive upswing. It went from like fifty dollars to up to $1,300 before it collapsed. And at the time, there was only very few ways you can trade, and, and shorting was a, a unique thing at that time. There's like maybe one other way to do it with futures and a couple other companies that were doing it, but like Mt. Gox is one of the only exchanges. Bitfinex came on, Ipbit came on, those were some of the earlier exchanges, and then obviously Mt. Gox happened, and um, it changed the landscape a bit. Uh, Bitcoin went into this bear market after all this infrastructure has started to come in around payment processors, around exchanges, around tools for ATM, like putting ATMs together and then just trying to build an infrastructure around Bitcoin. Back then too, there wasn't many other coins that exist as there are today. And growth kind of started to stop and then you start to see regulation, particularly in the US around the bit license. And we were moving out of uh, Australia at that point to make this company uh, more global. So London, Singapore and the US. And I was going back to New York for a while to be a part of the company. and. Um, Obviously, when the bit license came in, it became a deterrent for me as a U.S. Mm -hmm. citizen with the way that they were defining it, very vague. You didn't know what the rules were, and um, it just made us kind of dead halt from going into the U.S. So what I did as a result of that is I kind of left the company because I wanted to be in the U.S. or Australia, and it was more based in, you know, U.K. and Singapore. So I started focusing on the underlying technology, which is what really started to catch me and... Since then, I've kind of been working in the space in, in many different ways, helping people with their block check, blockchain architecture, designing, consulting on, on um, you know, the ICO market now that that's become a big thing, um, and really like writing about all the technology and, and the different types of ways that this technology exists and all these different ways of do, getting to consensus. And, and it's just been amazing the amount of stuff that's come into the space since then. So you started as a trader in the traditional markets, yeah. and then you found Bitcoin, I and found then you Bitcoin. started trading Bitcoin. I started trading Bitcoin. You found your first <laughs> company in this space, then you found blockchain. What was it, or not found, but what was it that sort of sparked this idea of working with blockchain and not just trading Bitcoin, for example? Yeah, so, you know, at, at first it was, like I said before, mainly only Bitcoin. But, like, then, you know, you, saw, you had the Ethereum guys that were kind of around New York at that point and all these other companies that were starting to look at novel ways of using this blockchain that wasn't just the way you use it for Bitcoin, you know, using smart contracts and all these other things. So the, the principles of, of a blockchain itself, you know, are just really amazing and don't exist, like, really anywhere else in the world in the way that they've been come together, all these different concepts to build the blockchain. But then you have like these other ways of building blockchains that aren't just Bitcoin. So all these different protocols are coming into the world that are used for different things with different tools that give you the main core, um, you know, things that you get from a blockchain that people always talk about, you know, like uh, censorship resistance, um, transparency of data, um, being able to, you know, not tamper with the history of data and stuff like that. 
And it's really, it's really, you know, that stuff was what really led me on the journey to looking at all this different technology and actually starting to see that this wasn't just going to be um, one coin, one asset, but it was going to become a giant new asset class. And um, at first, I started to just follow some projects that I knew. And at that time, also, you had this whole entire other subset of stuff that was going on around. We love the blockchain. We hate Bitcoin, right? And yes. you had all the private <laughs> blockchains. And, and look, again, you take some of the things of a blockchain and you put them into private blockchains, but you get rid of the crypto piece and, and some of the other parts of it that uh, aren't good for corporations, banks, and all that other stuff. But that whole discussion and that dialogue led to all of these different types of blockchains and the awareness of this technology kind of going mainstream at that point. Well, maybe not mainstream, but like all these different people starting to follow it and look into it, even if, you know, the dialogue was, you know, uh, bifurcating the community into people who once actually were working for um, the crypto and then they said, okay, well, this looks like it's going to die, so I'm going to move over here and focus my resources on that. And um, I've always been flexible in how I've worked and that I work for projects that I like, that I find interesting, and I'm always trying to learn. And like every project I work on, I learn new stuff. So I've done stuff with private blockchains. I work with crypto mainly now, but like um, startups, financial institutions, I've written white papers with all different types of people, KPMG, Gilbert and Tobin. Um, I write a blog on the underlying tech and, and all the, the, you know, the things that I find uh, really interesting with the technology and all the different texts and types of ways you can get to consensus and stuff like that, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it's always been so interesting and I've always felt so lucky to be involved in a space that's just like literally evolving really fast and the infrastructure is coming in all different ways and, and we're just like seeing this, only, it's still only at the beginning and it's just so exciting. Uh, so in all these projects that you've worked, do, have you encountered shortage of skills? Mm. What type of people are needed in this space that are not already awakened to it? Yeah, so it's really interesting. Yes, is the answer. In fact, every project I work on is suffering from a skill shortage. And mainly it comes, uh, well, I wouldn't say mainly, but it's usually a developer problem. And the developer problem is that everybody is raising tons of capital. They could throw lots of money at good devs. There isn't, it's still a giant learning curve. Blockchain, you know, smart contract languages are very new. So building on top of this, like people are learning on the fly. And aside from that, it's just hard in general to find good devs to work on pro projects that aren't even blockchain based. And you know, when you're building out a, a blockchain product, you're not just building out a blockchain product. There's other devs that need to be involved that aren't just specifically blockchain devs. So. That's one piece. Another piece that I'm finding a lot more now is um, really around what happens after UICF. Um, for, the, for those people who are listening and are not very familiar with this terminology, what's an ICO? Yeah, I, I actually hate this terminology. It just <laughs> is ingrained in my head and I keep using it over and over again even though I don't like it. It's, a, it's, called, it's like an initial coin. It's basically a way to raise capital. And ICO comes from IPO, which is done in the, in the public capital markets, so initial public offering. So it's a way for a, a company to uh, go out into the world and, and raise capital. And, and raising this capital... Um, you know, is done in, in different ways. There's different rounds. There's uh, different strategies around it. It mimics in some ways traditional markets. You have sales, private sales. Then you have this public sale. But I, in, in reality, like we are still seeing ICOs, but I think the ICO market as it's been and as it's been for a while is dying and it won't exist in any way, shape or form in the same way it has, mainly because doing public sales is becoming harder and harder from a regulatory standpoint. And basically, it's illegal in a lot of jurisdictions. So it's moving into the realm, especially some of the bigger projects, to private sales. Private sales comply generally with um, AML KYC, uh, securities laws that exist now, and they never um, make it to uh, giving it to retail. So retail is being shut out of this market just like it's been shut out of every other market in the past, yeah. which for some people is a massive problem, um, you know, because you want to get distribution of the coin, and people talk about distribution all the time. Um, but there's ways you can do that after the sale to get people coin if you really want to. I actually think that distribution can be overrated, particularly because 
Um, if it's getting into the hands of people who are never going to use the coin and they're only holding it for speculation, then it doesn't help the network to grow, right? No, and then you have to deal with things like Telegram where you have all these trolls who are complaining all the time about the project and, and publicly marring you, even if you're working behind the scenes quietly um, on the project, and you have to deal with them constantly. And it's not something you want to do when you're trying to focus on your work. So, you know, that's you have these community, community managers, but you also need the front-facing people to get in there sometimes to quell panics or perceived, uh, um, you know, bad things about the project that people are talking about. But, like, overall, it, it's more of a headache. So, you know, retail can buy on exchange. They're not going to get a better price than other people, which is, you know, sometimes a problem. Uh, they can get airdrops. They can, um, you can, which is basically getting coins to them if you want them to have coins. Um, you can target people, co companies, actors um, that will use your, uh, your blockchain by giving them coins to come and onboard you um, as part of the blockchain, right? So that's basically what an ICO is and, and kind of where I think it's shifting to. Back to the other point about where there's a skill shortage too is after the ICO, marketing is a massive skill shortage, particularly because you have so, this is a global game and it's yep. distributed. So you have all these amazing, awesome projects that are happening all over the world that are not Western language projects. So Chinese projects that are massive, they have no Western audience, no one in the West even knows they exist. But do they even need a, a global audience because they are so big? Um, in themselves. Yeah, I think they do. Of well, yeah, that's true. And no, they don't need it uh, to sell the product, but they pro they want it a to get recognition around what they're doing, to get coins into the hands of users. Even though I'm saying you always want to get it into the hands of users, speculation and price movements matter. When prices rise, attention comes on the coin. People, it comes into their attention, and price matters. Price always matters. It means that you're getting recognition that your coin is worth something. I mean, because people are getting more savvy, even though they're speculating. They're speculating on certain projects, projects that have tech, projects that are building tech, projects that are close to going from testnet to mainnet to live. And we're going to see a lot of that start to happen this year, which is really exciting because people have been waiting to see what's next and. Well, everyone's just buying coins. Well, where's the use cases? Where's it all coming from? And, and that's starting to happen. But like for a lot of these companies, you know, they just need more. Uh, they need a more global audience. While they don't need it to sell their coins, they need it from the standpoint of wanting people to understand what they're doing versus the competitors. Like you might have some Ethereum killers out there. You might have a Bitcoin killer out there, and no one would even know that it exists, right? So it's important for these guys to get people to understand their message. And I'm seeing that particularly out of Asia um, more than anywhere else. And by the way, I'd say that most of the Asian projects would, couldn't be considered undervalued versus their Western counterparts because the technology there is being built very fast, very scalable. And a lot of the projects are very close to launching products, whereas a lot of the companies that have raised in the West, it has been white paper and a promise without really tech. Well, that's changing now. It was like that for a long time in the beginning. So those projects are way behind the Asian projects that are actually just launching now. So you actually have like a weird market, right? Where like some of the projects now are actually probably more valuable, even though they're raising less money than the projects that were done a year to a year and a half ago, because they're nowhere near even having anything done yet. And they raised all this money and they're just like, people are waiting to see when are you going to launch? So it's, it's kind of an interesting place where you would think that older companies would have more value. Obviously, the top 10 are the oldest and do. But then you're starting to see all these new ICOs that are just shooting up the charts, um, all these companies. And you're like, where did that come from? Well, they actually have working tech, and they've been working behind the scenes on it for a long time. So it's, it's so interesting. So these are the ones that already have devs. So they are lacking other people in their team yeah. to sort of take the world the, the world by storm or yeah. put the world up, put the I, word out there. That's right. And that would actually even apply to in a lot of cases the the um, the leader of the team is a dev himself. So there's no you know business development is something also why you want to get known in the world because there's people out there that don't even know that you exist that might have a great usage for your platform for your protocol. And, and, you know, they're missing those pieces like business, business dev guys, CEOs who have a global presence or who understand the business world. Um, and, and that's really because this has been a, a pure tech play from the beginning. Business guys are the last guys to understand this technology now. Like, for example, Wall Street is the last guys to come into the market. I mean, there's been uh, this market that's been existing for a while. 
it's been built on people within the crypto community and then kind of getting into like millennials and people who are on computers like Reddit, seeing these things and starting to invest in them. And now you're starting to see the institutional money come in and it's going to make for an interesting dynamic as all this infrastructure gets built out around it. But yeah, so stuff like that is like super important. And, and like really, I think the focus, if you want to like look at where more value is going to be made in the future, if you're looking for work, it's going to be post raise, not pre raise. Pre raise is getting to be, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you once did, you're not doing anymore. Like, just because you don't need to if you're not going to have a public sale and need a lot of hype around what you're doing. If you can raise from big institutional money very quickly, $10 million, you don't need to do a lot of the things you would have had to done in the past. To have a project ready to go. To have a project, raise the capital, and then ready to go. What you don't, what you don't have, though, is after that, um, in, in some cases, a team ready that um, is ready to start salespeople, business dev, marketer, international marketers. So in a way, we're sort of going back to the, the, the normal startup model, where you have a, a whole bunch of devs hunch, hacking at a basement or a co-working space, in, in, work, developing an idea, then they raise funds, and then they hire a team, and same, same. Yeah, I think so, and I don't think that's actually a bad thing. I think like companies still need to be structured in certain ways where there's roles done and, and that you get a presence. I mean, what's different around this model is that you have this uh, asset which has is a, which is a scarce which is digital scarcity, right? And you need to build incentives and crypto economics around it in order to get the network people to use the network, and that still needs to be done. Post, uh, post raise also because what you think is going to happen in your white paper and what you write about as far as how you think the world is going to work in a vacuum doesn't work like that in the real world. Yes, because governance is hard, crypto economics is hard, and all that kind of stuff. And digital scarcity, it's it's an interesting uh, topic because how is digital scarcity scarce if there's so many digital assets out there? So you're competing, you're creating your own digital scarcity, but you're competing with a lot of other ones yeah. that are doing the same thing. Yeah, I actually think that's an interesting point, and um, I like I, I think of it like this. I think that um, it's it's scarce because you have a distributed world, right? And you have a distributed and blockchain is decent. It's a decentralized world. You have people from all different parts of the world who through the internet, which was one of the first decentralized, um, it was decentralizing information, gives you this ability. Now you can have people who own this scarcity from all different parts of the world and they could form a community around something that they believe in, whatever the project might be, and they don't need to be from the same place, have the same culture. Um, they come together and they form this community around it and they literally become the ones who in some ways maintain the security of the network by you know, uh, being validators of that network if it's a proof of stake model or something or mining the network or whatever. They also come and, and vote on the governance models around the network um, and they believe in the project and, and what it's for so that the transaction of those coins happens in this like we're going basically what I, from from the standpoint of something that I've been trying I've actually been wanting to write a blog about this for a while is that like we've passed peak globalization and and now what we're starting to see is decentralization shaping and we're gonna have more nations in the world um, now than we have in the past and the same thing happens on the local level like these are basically like local economies right mm -hmm. and we already have like complementary currencies that exist underneath um, the systems uh, that we have in the world now, right? So like the monetary systems. So I, to me, in a lot of cases, there will exist lots and lots of different cryptos. A lot of these will die though because A, they, the monetary, the, the crypto economics just won't work. They'll get no traction around their ideas. They're scams. Um, there's a lot of people doing the same things and, and you can't, uh, like everything else, there'll be consolidation in the industry. And then quite simply, some of the protocols just won't, win versus other protocols. Mm -hmm. So how the technology shakes out. But I think it's not going to be a world of one cryptocurrency or two cryptocurrencies. It's going to be lots of chains, lots of coins. And, um, you know, I and, and that's really how I look at it. And, you know, so the scarcity comes within the networks themselves and how yeah. you, um, as, as, a, as a person using the network, as a person who is uh, working on the project of the network, as a person who is securing and validating that network, how you all work together to make sure that uh, 
you the the network has user users coming on to use it, and then um, how you get a value around the coin based on what you're trying to do there. And and, and it's 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 a model that is still everyone's trying to figure out. You know, how do you fundamentally value these networks? How how do you get your crypto economics right? And um, that's another really interesting field. And I guess like if you're talking about where jobs are and where there's scarcity, it would be in people who can understand, you know, cryptography, economics, and, and basically game theory, and, and put them together to try and make these models around um, securing uh, a network where you have to presume that people are always trying to attack it and, and steal from it. Yes, that's a big <laughs> job. <laughs> so for the people who are now looking into coming to crypto, do you have any advice as to where do they where do they begin how do they find the the, the need their niche yeah so i mean you have a lot of people who have come into crypto through speculation right they've bought these coins because um a there's been lots of hype around them and and you know people there people have made fortunes and then lost fortunes and now the boom and the bust we just saw and you know all that but those things are always good because they portend a future of where this is going to exist. There's always hype, then there's a bust, but then there's a technology that comes out of this that changes the world. And, and, and that's where we are. So I think like, you know, speculating on coins isn't where you're going to get the most uh, value, I guess, for yourself if you want to build out the future, right? So I would say if you're an owner of coins and you bought those coins for a reason because you like the project or whatever, approach the companies because they all need help. They all need help. And if you have some kind of unique skill set and you are enthusiastic because you own the coin, you might be able to get them to give you work in some way, shape or form. Um, another thing obviously is, and, and, and you know, uh, this is something that is always talked about, learn how to code or, and, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's always room for you on a team if you're a dad. Um, and, and you know, I think that's another way. Another way is to just approach people who you admire, like if you're reading blogs all the time, listening to podcasts, um, very easy to get in touch with people. And if you can't get in touch with them yourselves, you know, people, there's lots of connectors in this space and everyone is always trying to help each other out. It's a really positive atmosphere, which is another reason why it's such a great place to work. So like, I, I think like, you know, that's how I would do it. Um, if I was, um, you know, go to meetups like the blockchain professionals meetup in Sydney. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, a really good one. <laughs> um, yeah, and so that's that's some advice that I would say on that front. Yeah. That's it. I think we're good. Um, anything you would like to add? Um, I would say. The, you know, thinking about the space and like just some thing. I, this is more just of an afterthought, I guess, of some trends that I think are going to be important, particularly in the cryptocurrency space um, and blockchain space is um, things around interoperability and, and privacy. Um, for me, privacy is a, a, a glaring issue that still hasn't been solved. People always like to say, and I still hear people, and I can't believe this, like I listen to podcasts saying Bitcoin is anonymous and it's just not. not it's yeah. synonymous. It leaks data. Ethereum leaks data. So, like, privacy coins are big and getting bigger. Ways to um, ha have privacy around smart contracts, um, you know, zero-knowledge proofs, all these things. It's a really big field. And it's not just for people who are trying to hide things um, f illegally. It's because privacy, as we've seen from some of these big organizations, is not respected by anybody. They take your data. They use your data. You get nothing in return for it. So being able to permission your stuff to somebody else is massively important and also to get something back for it instead of basically you working for these big corporations. I think that's huge and then I think interoperability is massive. So when I said before I was talking about all these blockchains um, that I think will exist, there needs to be a bridge between them. Um, and that's what interoperability aims to solve, how we can have coins go from one blockchain to another and how value can be interchanged between different blockchains, transactions, data, etc. That is the next layer that's being built out too and there's, I think that's really exciting as well. And that's really it. That's awesome. <laughs> um, how can people find you if they want to connect with you? Um, so I have a website called semantics.com. On it is my blog. Um, and 
I think you can write to me there, but if not, I have my email. Uh, you can find me there. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, my email is georgesteman42 at gmail.com. Please give me a holler if you need anything, and yeah, that's where I'd be found. Awesome. Thank you, George. Thanks. That was it. I hope you enjoyed this chat. Um, thanks for being here and listening to the first episode of Blockchain Pro Podcast. I certainly enjoyed my first experience. It was a bit nerve wracking as new things tend to be, but let's press forward and keep, keep on going. Um, if you enjoyed, please subscribe. There'll be lots more coming. Next episode will be with Boki Puba. Uh, or Boki Ku. He is a Ethereum developer and has a lot of cool things to talk about Ethereum tech and how he got started. So I'll see you at the next episode. Thanks for listening. Till the next block.